Church. When I was younger, I used to go to vacation Bible school at Colfax Nazarene, and the person who ran it each year was named Rainbow, and each year we would have a different theme. One year, we learned all about the armor of God, and we learned a catchy little song about getting our gospel shoes on and carrying the sword of the Spirit, and that song still gets stuck in my head sometimes. That song was a good reminder about the spiritual battle we all face that Paul talks about in Ephesians. He talks about arming ourselves against the powers of the dark world. Paul wanted us to understand and even visualize the truth that there is a force of evil or the enemy who is actively influencing us and working to separate us from God and his will for our lives. I feel Paul's goal was to help us, or at least me, understand our struggle, or at least my struggle, to live every day and in every way for Jesus. Not just to understand the struggle, but to offer a solution or an effective response that each of us can make and should make in the face of adversi- adversity, temptation, and strife. Paul reminds us in this passage that God has not left us alone in this all-too-real battle that's being waged over our very souls, but has in fact given us the tools necessary to survive the spiritual warfare that's happening all around us and over us over our very souls and identities in Christ. We need to remember that the enemy wants nothing more than to strip our identities in Jesus and convince us there is no hope for us, that we are unsavable. But God wants us to put on the armor that he has provided, spiritual armor, which will protect us from the schemes of the enemy. But God doesn't want us to attempt to fight this battle on our own, or at all for that matter. Paul tells us that God simply wants us to use the weapons that he has provided us to stand, to stand firmly in our faith and firmly in the face of any assault the enemy makes. God wants us to remember that the battle belongs to him and that we are to exercise our faith by remaining steadfast, trusting him no matter the circumstance. In 2 Chronicles 2015, the Hebrews were reminded of this truth, that the battle belongs to God. When the writer wrote, Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord. So let's take a look at a passage in Ephesians six ten through 20 and see what Paul's talking about, starting with verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Paul is closing out this letter with a summary of all he wrote in the previous chapters, reminding us that we will have opposition from the enemy as we live our lives for Christ. Paul is encouraging us to remain strong in our faith by relying on God's mighty power, not our own power, which would be an exercise of futility. Verse 11 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Paul reminds us that our protection, or armor, belongs to God. Basically, without God's armor, we would be powerless to withstand Satan's schemes. But with God's power and his armor, we will be able to stand firm in our faith. Verse 12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul uses sharp imagery of evil powers, demons, and evil spirits to remind us that the enemy we face is different than anything we've ever seen before, and not anything we would know how to defeat in our own power. Verse 13 says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. In this verse, Paul gives us both the necessary response that every believer should make, as well as a solution to the battle being raged against each one of us. Paul doesn't give us an option to put on this piece of armor or that piece of armor, but instructs us us to put on every piece of armor, which I believe becomes available as we mature in our faith. Paul doesn't say to put on the armor that we might be victorious, but to put it on so that at the end of the spiritual assault aimed at us, we will still be standing firm in our faith. Verse 14 says, Stand your ground, 
putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Again, Paul instructs us, instructs us to stand our ground and to do so by putting on the belt of truth, which to me is that Jesus is God from the beginning of creation, that he was born of the virgin, was fully man and fully God, that he was without sin, that he was mocked, beaten, and crucified for our sin, and he died on the cross to pay a ransom for our sins, that he was resurrected on the third day, conquering death and giving us, and giving us those who believe, eternal life through the free gift of grace. And the body armor of God's righteousness is Christ Jesus. He is our righteousness. And when we rest in his truth and abide in his love and will, we are covered with his righteousness. Verse 15 says, For shoes put on the peace that comes from God, from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. The peace that comes from the good news is the blessed assurance we have in Christ, that we have a future with him for all eternity in heaven. Verse 16 says, In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Paul is reminding us that trials and tribulations will inflict us, but that because of our blessed assurance in the blood of Jesus, our faith will be strong enough to endure to the end. Verse 17 says, Put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. A helmet, or headgear, is one of the most important pieces of armor, because our head is so vulnerable. So it's no mistake that Paul uses the imagery of our salvation as a helmet. For without a helmet, we certainly would be doomed in the midst of a battle. And without salvation, we have no hope outside of this world. In the second half of this verse, Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The writer of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I think Paul's reminding us to know God's Word, to test everything to God's Word, not to use His Word as a weapon to beat people up, but instead a weapon that will deflect lies the enemy tells us. Verse 18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Paul is just reminding us how important it is to have a strong prayer life, to pray in God's will, not our own, to be relentless and passionate in our prayer lives. And 19 and 20 say, and pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him, as I should. In these last two verses, Paul reminds us that we all need prayer. For strength, for encouragement, for boldness, for perseverance, that we all will have a living testimony that points to a living God. So be encouraged today, and remember that spiritual, spiritual warfare is real, but God, in all his wisdom, is our solution to any attack from the enemy. So stand firm and be strong in the Lord, and remember the battle belongs to him. Be encouraged, church. I hope you are able to join us for church on Sunday at 9 a.m.